Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. The Way of Life. Being. Notes of Lectures Delivered in Scandinavia, 1904. By J. Boyd. Revised. London, G. Morrish, 20, Paternoster Square. 1906. The Mediator, Job 32, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 to 6. The law said before man what his work was to be, grace brings before us the work of God. The law proposed blessing for man on the ground of obedience, but there was a curse pronounced upon the disobedient. Cursed is everyone who continues not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. And we read, if a man keep the whole law, and offend in one point, he is guilty of all. One sin will prove the man who commits it to be a sinner, as one apple will prove the tree upon which it has grown to be an apple tree. By the law is the knowledge of sin. If the law went no farther than to say, thou shalt not steal, many a man could take the place of being righteous, but it says, thou shalt not covet, and there every man is detected. Paul says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. He found out that the law took account of what was deeper than the outward act. It was not only that he was not to steal, he was not to lust after things that were not his. Therefore the law was a ministration of death and condemnation, sin revived, and I died. But in Christ God brings himself before us in another character. He has taken account of our need and has made provision for it. And in Christ he has approached the whole world. When he came with a law that brought no blessing to men, he came only to one nation, he addressed himself to Israel, but if he takes up the attitude of Saviour the whole world comes into view. Nicodemus has to learn that, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It is no longer to one nation that God addresses his word, but to all men. This is declared in the Gospel, repentance and remission of sins were to be preached among all nations. God has drawn near to man as a friend. Man never thought to find a friend in God. He had naturally no confidence in his Creator. He broke with God when he became a sinner, and to this day he has no desire for the healing of the breach. He wishes not to have to do with God, nor would he ever have sought God if left to himself. But God had desires after man, and if man will not seek God, God will seek him. If there is none that seeks after God, there is a God who seeks after man. He sought after Adam and Eve when they had abandoned him, and when they were doing their best to make it impossible for him to find them. They hid themselves away from him when they heard him in the garden. They could only think of him as a judge. And even today with the gospel ringing in the ears of men few wake up to the fact that God is seeking after them in grace. People are liable to think there can be nothing for them in the heart of God but wrath. What a mistake this is. Job thought God was against him, but he has to learn that God was the only one that was truly for him. Satan, Sabines, the winds and the fire of heaven, his wife and his three friends, all were against him, and set for his destruction or condemnation. And last of all he has to learn that he was against himself. There was only one in the universe his friend, and he was the one Job only esteemed as his enemy. And all God's dealings with him were for his good. All the enemies mentioned were controlled by God. They were only allowed to go a certain length. They would have destroyed Job body and soul had they been allowed, but God sets a limit to their power, and like the lance in the hand of the skillful surgeon. It can only touch that which is destructive to life and separate between the precious and the vile. He thought he was being hardly dealt with, but it was all brought upon him in the goodness and love of God, and he is able to give thanks for it all in the end. Job was not a mere ordinary sinner. He was a sinner, for all men are sinners, but there was a work of grace in his heart, and it was this that made him all that he was in his pathway as commendable to God. He was the most perfect man upon the earth, but it was not the goodness of the flesh that made him so, it was God's work in his soul. God commends him when speaking to Satan, and the enemy, unable to deny his perfections, can only attribute them to base motives, he accuses him of serving God because it paid him to do so. But God knew his servant, though the poor servant knew not himself. All the goodness he possessed he attributes to the flesh. He knew he was more upright than others, but he did not know that his uprightness was the effect of the grace of God. That as to the flesh he was no better than others who were in his eyes not fit to be classed with the dogs of his flock. He was fast becoming self-occupied and self-complacent, and a heavy fall was imminent unless God intervened. He had become an object to himself, and God was being displaced through the foolish pride that was like a noxious weed in his heart. Elihu was the only one who could enlighten Job. 
his three friends sought to convict him of sin. Their thought was that all the evil that had befallen him was on account of his transgressions. They were not able to convict him of any special overt act of sin, but they suggested a great many things in the hope that some of them would strike home to his conscience. But it was useless, Job maintained his integrity. He had walked in all good conscience before God, and he had the consciousness that God would acquit him in the end, and that could he only draw near to him his justification would be assured. But God was not to be found. If he went forward he was not there, and if he went backward he could not perceive him. He could not behold him on the left hand or on the right. And in his agony he cries out, Oh that I knew where I might find him. That I might come even to his seat. Then again a sense of the vast disparity that existed between himself, a poor loathsome creature, and the Creator presses upon his mind, and in his distress he cries out. For he is not a man, as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us, that might lay his hand upon us both. He felt altogether too little and too feeble to deal directly with God. Were he only a man Job felt he could approach to him and expound his cause before him, and let him see that there was no just cause for the treatment he felt he was receiving. But the one who afflicted him was hidden from him, and his greatness was a terror to him. He reasoned from what he was to God, and so did his three friends. It was never a question in any of their minds as to what God might be in his grace and goodness. In the judgment of those three wise men man supplied God with an incentive to love or hate, and their argument was that Job must have committed some great wickedness to fall, as he had apparently done. Under the displeasure of God. And while Job knew that this was not so, for his conscience was good, he was as ignorant as they were as to God's ways with him. And his only argument was that God had acted in an absolutely arbitrary manner, without respect to the righteousness or the wickedness of the creature. This wakes up Elihu, who had not hitherto been heard. He speaks in hot anger. He is angry with the three friends because they had condemned Job without being able to enlighten him, and he is angry with Job because instead of justifying God he had justified himself. And had made it appear that when God deals with his creature his righteousness or unrighteousness is of no account. Thus he was advocating the cause of wicked men, and charging God with being indifferent to evil. Elihu is angry with them because of these things, and he rises up to speak on behalf of God, who had been dishonored by their speeches. He waited until all the others had said all they had to say, and then he lifts up his voice on behalf of God. He would have Job justified, but he must first of all justify God. He was the mediator who spoke in God's stead. He says to Job, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. Elihu was a type of Christ, the true mediator. Man had hard thoughts of God, Satan had falsified him in the thoughts of his creature. But Jesus came into this world to speak on God's behalf, when everyone was speaking on behalf of sinful man. And Christ waited until everyone else had spoken. Sage, philosopher, law and prophet had all been given their opportunity before Christ came to set God forth in his true light. His mission was to save sinners, he did not come to condemn, but he would declare the righteousness and faithfulness of God whatever might happen. Man must be exposed in the utter sinfulness of his condition, but it will be by that in which the love of God to man is declared. By Jesus, and above all by his death, the wicked heart of man has been exposed, but also by Jesus, and above all by his death, the love of God to man has been brought to light. Job can listen to Elihu. The words of his friends irritated him, he found neither wisdom nor comfort in them. He says, miserable comforters are ye all. But he could listen to Elihu. There was healing balm in his words. As he listens to the mediator God comes before his soul in his true light, like the sun from behind the dark cloud the light and warmth of the kindness of God steal over his poor broken heart, which until now had been in the gloom of a wintry night. He lets Job know that all that had come upon him was for his good, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he might be enlightened with the light of the living. Job had lost all that flesh holds dear. His property, his family, his health, his status amongst men, all were gone, and it was all for the good of his soul. No one showed him his vileness as Elihu did, and yet the words that laid him low as a naked sinner before God were the only words to which he could have patience to hearken. And is it not so as to the words of Jesus? Man was never so exposed as a sinner as in the presence of the Son of God, and yet who was so attractive to the sinner? Publicans and sinners drew near to hear him. In the presence of the light of God Job goes down in self-judgment. He says, I abhor myself. When his three friends had said all they had to say his confidence in himself was still unshaken, he felt himself to be morally superior to them. But the light of God brought him down, mine eye sees thee, was what slew the sinful pride of his heart. I suppose that all that Job had said of himself was true. 
it was the effect of the grace of God in him, it did not belong to him naturally. And God, in the midst of his dealings with him, and by those dealings was letting him feel this. He recounted his good deeds, dwelt upon them, called them to mind, and recited them in the unwilling ears of his friends. This is, I suppose, what he refers to when he says, though I take snow water and wash myself never so clean. He seeks to adorn himself with his good deeds. But God lets his light into his soul, and he adds, yet thou wilt plunge me in the ditch again, and my own clothes shall abhor me. That which was the work of God's grace in him refused. So to speak, to be decorations for the flesh, his clothes abhorred him, and later on he comes to the same mind as his clothes, he abhors himself. God will have all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He has taken up the attitude of Saviour toward all, and has approached man in the Mediator, one who can lay his hand upon us both. He is great enough to lay his hand upon God, for he is a divine person, and not too great to lay his hand upon me, for he is a man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. An angel would not do, for he is too great for me, his hand would be too heavy upon me. I am weak and feeble, and he knows nothing of weakness. But he is not great enough to lay his hand upon God, for he is but a creature. But in Jesus my need and the need of God are perfectly met. I cannot now say of God, he is not a man, as I am, for he has become man in the person of Christ. And in this way God has drawn near to us that he might gain the confidence of our hearts. No one was afraid of Jesus. No one was too timid to approach him. His terror made no one afraid. Jesus was accessible to all. However vile and degraded the poor sinner might be, he had the consciousness in the presence of Jesus that he was welcome there. The words might be read in every act of the Son of God, him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. And he gave himself a ransom for all. It is not only that the Mediator has come and spoken to us, but he has died for us, died for all. Why was this? Because God would have all men to be saved. The way of salvation has been opened up for all, and the testimony of the grace of God goes out in the power of the Spirit everywhere throughout this dark world. In this world where God is not known, where every desire of the natural heart of man is wrong, and where every thought of God is dreadful. And where the day in which God must be met is looked forward to with indescribable terror, the testimony is rendered. The Mediator has spoken on behalf of God, and the Holy Spirit continues the testimony in this world of sinners. Everything is against you. All the influence of this world is opposed to your soul's interests. But God has shown himself for you in Christ, in his death, and in his resurrection. He desires to deliver you from the pit, that you may live in the light of the living.